is one of three known existing standalone GAR halls in the state of Illinois. Uh, the other two are in upstate. The one is in Aurora, the other one is in Rockford. Uh, both of those are owned by their municipalities and were built with public funds. Uh, the Peoria GAR Hall is the only one that was built with private funds and stayed in private hands for its entire life. Uh, it was built in 1909. Uh, the GAR post had been in existence in Peoria since 1879. Uh, they had a rented third floor walk up about two blocks away from this site. And uh, as the members aged, uh, they decided they uh, did not want to do all those stairs. So uh, the post commander at the time, Byron Cloyd Briner, decided that he would try to raise funds uh, to build their own standalone hall. And he uh, set out to raise funds, first with the post members and then with the general public. However, uh, that was not going to be enough. One of the former post members, a man by the name of Joseph Benedict Greenhut, uh, he came down from Chicago uh, originally. Uh, he lost his business in the uh, Great Chicago Fire, but he had relatives in Peoria. He said, come on down, the water's fine. He was in distilling, so that's the why the water is very important. So uh, he became fabulously wealthy and was a member of the post for you know, quite a few years. Uh, but by the time this hall was built, he had moved to New York, but he still continued to come down to Peoria to visit. When he discovered that his post uh, comrades were wanting to build a hall, he started to write checks. He wrote many checks and big ones. Uh, this building cost $22,800 to build in 1909, and uh, Captain Greenhut provided 16,000 of those uh, funds. That's why his name is on the top of the uh, building outside. Uh, this building was designed in the Beaux Art style by the firm Hewitt and Emerson. Uh, they were the winning bid. Uh, several other architectural firms were in the running. Uh, this design turned out to be the most cost effective and was able to be built for a reasonable amount of money. The cornerstone was laid on July 4th, 1909, and the building was completed in December and the grand opening was on December 31st of 1909, so it went up pretty fast. If you want to step over to the side here, you'll notice that we have a bust of John A. Logan, General. Uh, this bust was created by local artist Fritz Treble for the Chicago World's Fair in 1892. After the fair was over, he donated it to the post and stands here today. The same glass window above the front entryway was put in in 1910. Uh, the original windows uh, in the hall were just plain glass. Uh, the center of the window uh, was uh, damaged in the mid-1960s. Between age and uh, vandalism, the window was lost for a number of years. Uh, the center of the window was restored in 2000 using an Illinois First grant by the company Stained Glass of Peoria. Uh, unfortunately, that company no longer exists. Uh, they were able to recreate the window in its exact entirety by using a blown up black and white photograph. They were able to create all the uh, pieces in an exact size and they matched the colors uh, of the stained glass uh, from the surrounding uh, arch that they uh, made. picture here is uh, one of the reasons we should be uh, saving this hall, amongst many. Uh, Andersonville, where there was a lot of Civil War prisoners, is actually uh, a place now where they have a POWMIA museum, where they have all the uh, numbers and uh, videos of people that were POWs. There, there, there are POWMIAs from this war too, from the Civil War. Actually, from and uh, that's that's a sad thing. Speaking of POWMIAs, <laughs> I'm going to get on that subject whether you like it or not. Um, in my opinion, if if uh, you uh, aren't there, to, the flag and all that stuff, 
if you forget about the POWs and MIAs, then they don't exist anymore. If you forget about the history of the Civil War, it doesn't exist anymore. You need places like this to remind you of what happened. Uh, to me, in the classrooms, they aren't teaching history enough. With, without history, you don't know what you did wrong and how to improve on things. My example was, uh, there's a lot of people that, that uh, look back and say, hey, I did this and I can prove on it. Um, basketball players, football players, whatever. They, they check and see what they've done wrong to, to get better at it. Um, Tiger Woods, he developed his, uh, his uh, golfing abilities because of mistakes he made. He checked out the history of what he'd done wrong, what he'd done right. If you don't have history like this, you just don't have an opportunity to find out what, what went right and what went wrong. After the veterans were in the hall uh, for a number of years, uh, their numbers dwindled. Uh, by 1926, there were only about a dozen or so Civil War veterans. Because you have to remember, during the Civil War, just like uh, you know, today's armed forces, the average age of, an, of a soldier was 25 years old. So speed forward you know, decades to the 1920s, uh, they were dying off at a fairly rapid pace. And the basics, of the GAR was for Civil War veterans only. So when the last Civil War veteran died, the GAR ceased to exist. So by the mid-1920s, the numbers were dwindling here in Peoria as well. So in 1926, uh, the post members elected to turn the hall over to what's known as the Allied Orders. The Allied Orders are the auxiliary groups, the Sons of Union veterans, Daughters of Union veterans, uh, the Women's Relief Corps, uh, the uh, Briner uh, Women's Group. So they took care of the hall and used it, rented it out to other organizations, church groups, and for their own uses, you know, up into the 1960s when their numbers began to dwindle. Now they they're not limited uh, to uh, you know just being you know veterans or whatnot. They could you know, have daughters, granddaughters, sons, grandsons, and continue on. But they were having a, a, huff, a tough time, you know, growing their groups too and maintaining what they had. What was almost a nail in the coffin for this building occurred in the early 1970s. What was happening around town was urban renewal. Buildings were coming down, new ones were going up, vacant lots were created. And why is that important? Well, this 
building, along with many other buildings in the downtown area, were heated by steam. The steam was provided by the local utility company. And by the early 1970s, there were fewer and fewer buildings that required steam heat. So the Central Oil Light Company told the remaining uh, groups and buildings that were using the utility service that it was going to be discontinued. Unfortunately, the women's groups and the auxiliaries did not have money to put furnaces in this building. So this building went for two years without heat. On top of that, uh, the stonework needed repair on the front. You know, little bits were pulling loose and dropping on the sidewalk. And the city actually uh, condemned this building. There was a work order put in for demolition and only 60 days remained. There were no takers when the building was put up for sale. So it was very uncertain whether this building would become another parking lot downtown. What saved this building was an article in the Journal Star, the local paper, and the uh, article was written by a columnist named Theo Jean Kenyon. And she wrote a full page article about this building, what this building was, how it came to be, and why it's important to keep it. So a group of uh, civic-minded individuals got together and created the Central Illinois Landmarks Foundation. Now their goal was to save this building. So they went before uh, the Board of Trustees that uh, helped uh, this building. And they said, if we can raise money to save this building, we would turn over title to the Landmark Foundation. An agreement was written and money was started to be raised. First thing that was done was to stabilize the building fix the roof that was leaking, I get some furnaces in, I do what needed to be done just to make the building weather tight. After that was done, then they started in earnest raising money uh, to restore the building to its grandeur. Uh, this room that we're standing in, the auditorium was the first room that was completed. Uh, they held a grand opening in 1979. They had a, a very nice historical Civil War based program. Uh, the building was also available for uh, people to rent for parties and receptions and uh, civic events, and it's still like that today. And of course, the Landmark Foundation being a private organization, it's a not-for-profit, 501c3, uh, not-for-profit, so people can uh, donate and donate and take money off of their taxes and for their donations. That really helped a lot. So they continued to raise money, they wrote for grants. Many grants were received over the years, uh, the biggest of which was in 2000 through the Illinois FIRST program and also the Caterpillar Foundation. Uh, that enabled uh, many things to be restored, air conditioning to be put in. Uh, uh, the lower level beneath us is a dining room the same size uh, as the auditorium. Uh, restoration was begun, uh, but the funding ran out and it was not completed. Now fast forward a few more years, to 2008, an agreement uh, was uh, produced between an individual and the Landmark Foundation who was going to uh, uh, create programming and actually push uh, rentals uh, for uh, parties and receptions. And so the Landmark Foundation took out a, a bank loan to finish the renovations, uh, build uh, modern restrooms, uh, rebuild the kitchen uh, to be a catering kitchen, finish the downstairs dining room uh, walls and uh, whatnot. Unfortunately, what happened in 2008 nationally, the economy went south. Uh, the person who was uh, financing and backing uh, the individual who was going to do all these great things for the hall uh, went bankrupt and lost many of his properties and, and had to pull out. So that left the Lamar Foundation uh, with a bank note to pay, which was $100,000, that's not small change, and no income. So over the past uh, 14, 15 years, uh, they've been struggling, renting out on their own, you know, scratching up money and grants where they could. But many of the grants have fallen away. Many of the people who used to donate you know, moved on, passed away, or no longer can. So here we are today in 2023. Not as bad as we were 50 years ago, but we're still in the state of, we're always 
looking for people to show the hall to. That way they can see the history. Now, if you go around downtown Peoria, there's so few of the buildings from you know, the early 1900s or late 1800s left. This is one of the few. And why is an old building important? Not just because it's an old building and it's nice to have, but it's the history behind it. You know, the, the, the Civil War veterans, they fought and died to preserve the Union. And they built this hall as a memorial not to themselves, but to what they believed in. And so it's important that we keep these buildings, not just because they're, they're cool, which they are, but as an example of history. And it's living history, because we today can still use these buildings. standing in now is the original quartermaster's office. The quartermaster was the man that the uh, Civil War veteran went to to sign up for his uh, Civil War pension or his uh, uh, wife and children to come in for survivor's benefits. Uh, this room originally had a large desk in it uh, for the quartermaster. There was a large uh, jewelry store type vault uh, records were kept in. Uh, the bookcases behind me uh, were constructed in 2009 uh, to hold uh, basically what is uh, left of the collection from the Peoria Public Library stacks in the uh, lower level. In 2010, the Peoria Public Library was in the midst of a uh, remodeling and addition to their main uh, library downtown here. In the basement were uh, many, many volumes of older books uh, that were not being saved. Uh, they had not been cataloged in the uh, computer catalog. And my wife uh, was a 30-year uh, employee of the library, and she could not bear to see uh, some of these Civil War-related uh, volumes uh, go into the dumpster. Uh, so uh, she was able to retrieve them, and uh, I built these shelves here. and. Uh, here they are today. Built-in bookcase uh, was built uh, when the hall was constructed, and it contains uh, what is known as the War of Rebellion Official Records, otherwise known as the OR. Uh, the volumes you see in this picture are actually a reprint from the 1980s. Uh, we do uh, still have an uh, almost complete set of the original OR that was printed in the late 1800s up to the early 1900s. Uh, these are available um, in many different libraries. And they're also uh, available on uh, CD-ROMs and online. These uh, chairs that you're looking at now uh, were bought by the Civil War veterans uh, for this hall when it was built. Uh, they originally, originally sat at each of the four altar stations. Uh, the GAR based a lot of their rituals on um, uh, Freemasonry, so they had four altars, and these are the uh, chairs at each altar that the uh, officers of the uh, post would sit at. Uh, three of the four chairs were restored around, 19, uh, around 2009 uh, by Les Kenyon. Uh, he was the uh, longtime president of the Central Illinois Landsmark Foundation. Uh, he passed away in 2010. Uh, the OR was basically a compilation of all of the orders and correspondence uh, that took place between the, basically the officers of the various regiments and companies. Uh, this was all collected by the federal government and published into these volumes. This wheelchair is one of the few uh, remaining artifacts of the post. Uh, many of the post artifacts were dispersed in the 1960s when the women's groups were struggling. Uh, they gave them 
away to their members, sold some, some went to the Pure Historical Society, uh, which retains uh, some of the artifacts today. The room I'm standing in now was the original uh, men's restroom. In 2016, uh, Theo Kenyon, as a memorial to her husband, Les, uh, provided the money to create this elevator to make this building uh, ADA compatible and allow uh, anybody with physical uh, disabilities to access the hall. You know, back when the hall was built, uh, the veterans thought they were in Clover only having to come up 15 steps. But today, uh, we like to be a little more accommodating. Uh, so this elevator was uh, built to access uh, this floor, uh, the floor beneath us, and there's an exterior entrance. The room we're in now is the veterans dining hall. It originally had a wood floor uh, unfortunately, uh, termites uh, uh, took care of uh, destroying that, uh, so concrete was poured uh, during the uh, renovations that were uh, commencing in 2000. The light fixtures are original to this building, both upstairs and down. The interesting thing about this building is they also had gas lighting, but gas lights were basically the backup emergency lighting of the day because they still didn't trust the electricity to be uh, there when they needed it. But this building was built specifically with all the modern amenities, electric lights, steam heat, a full kitchen. Uh, the original kitchen uh, was in very sad shape uh, by 2000 and 2008. Uh, there were large wood cabinets, floor to ceiling, around most of this room. Uh, where I'm standing now used to be a wall uh, with a door uh, that led into the kitchen behind me. Now, the kitchen originally had a eight foot tall, six foot wide ice box. Uh, there used to be a, a large gas stove and uh, work tables. Uh, all those were in poor shape and removed. And what you see today is a uh, catering kitchen. Uh, they did not want to put in a full kitchen uh, because of uh, Health department uh, regulations are much more uh, stringent uh, for a full kitchen. Uh, so a catering kitchen allows uh, groups to have caterers come in. Uh, their food can be uh, kept chilled in the refrigerator. Uh, there's uh, sinks for washing up uh, dishes and, and uh, other things like that. Most people who have driven by this building hundreds of times never really thought about it. Yeah, they always wondered, What's the deal about the building with the cannon in front? Well, number one, that's not a cannon. It's a mortar. It's 8,000 pounds of cast iron. It was donated by the federal government uh, to be placed in front of this hall, and it arrived shortly after the building was completed. Uh, the post only had to pay uh, for the shipping and the, uh, the wherewithal to mount it. Mortars of that size were generally used in coastal defenses, uh, defenses of forts. Occasionally they'd be put on railroad cars, but those were not meant to be used in the field. Uh, the stack of balls on the other side of the entryway are 110 pounds each empty. Uh, those are empty, they're welded together so they'd uh, you know, stay stacked the way they are. History isn't dead. History lives. You too can be a part of history by helping to save this hall. And so it will continue on for many, many, many more decades. It is available for rent through the Central Illinois Landmarks Foundation. Uh, they have a website which you'll uh, see a, a slide with all the pertinent information. Uh, there's also a Facebook page. You just need to type in GR Hall Peoria and and something will pop up that has uh, pictures and videos of, of what's been going on at the hall. Uh, you can donate uh, to the Central Learning Landmarks Foundation through a link on their website. Uh, they have several uh, levels of donation. Uh, there's no limit, as, as little or as much as uh, you feel that you'd like to donate. But history is important, buildings are important. If you go to Europe, you see Buildings that are hundreds of years old, 
uh, since the United States is a fairly young country uh, by those standards. You know, we need to keep you know, these old places, not just because of the architecture, but because of what they stand for, uh, who built them, and just to keep them going.